Now let me introduce our guest speaker from Rome, Dr. Christian Iaione. We came across Professor Iaione through our connections with the European Cultural Foundation, which we will sadly lose once Brexit is invoked, and the Liverpool Air Project, which we were running at the time. An article he wrote appeared in their magazine, Build the City, in both the February and June editions of this year. I knew immediately we needed to hear his ideas in Liverpool. Christian Iaione is Associate Professor of Public Law at the Guglielmo Marconi University of Rome since May 2014 and a Fellow of the Urban Law Centre at Fordham University in the United States. He is also Associate Professor of Institutional Communication and Governance of the Commons at LUISS Guido Carli University School of Law in Rome since September 2011 where he, since 1999, has also been Associate Professor of Administrative Law. Professor Iaioni has published extensively in the field of public and administrative law, and in particular, land use, public goods and the commons, public services and public contracts, urban law and local government. He has authored two books on in-house publicly owned companies, Steve Mumby will be smiling already at the thought of that. The first one is Contribution to the Principle of Self-Organisation and Self-Production of Local Governments. And the second is The Regulation of Urban Mobility. And he's co-authored Italy of the Commons and The Age of Sharing. Christian is Director and Co-Founder of LabGov, the Laboratory for the governance of the commons, not a future Labour government, as some of you might be suspecting, which initially came into being through the Guido Carli University Department of Political Science and is now an independent organisation. LabGov is based on the idea that in order to achieve social and institutional regeneration, it is necessary to create collaborative relationships between citizens, administrations, and businesses to share scarce resources and to take care of the commons, whether tangible or intangible, in urban and local communities. LabGov believes the current economic crisis has impoverished all of us from an individual and collective standpoint. And the only way to maintain a good quality of life is to create a new institutional and economic system based on the model of civic collaboration, collaborative governance of the commons, and circular subsidiarity, in which public institutions and political administrations work with all citizens, as individuals or organisations, who are willing to care for the common good. Please welcome to the podium Dr Christian Iaione. I think I can go directly. So I thank you, thank you, Jerry, thank you all for being here. I, you raised so uh, high expectations, and I will try to make everything I can to lower them. <laughs> and uh, basically, I'm here to share my experience and my my studies, and also my practice on the ground because I've been always for my life, for my academic life, and also as a professional trying to mm, work on, on practices, on generating new practices, on new innovations, basically, and together with local governments and, and local communities and, 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 and you know, practitioners that work in, in urban areas. So, basically, this is about the uh, co-city project, the co-city idea, the, the idea of a collaborative city, and this is a project that uh, uh, I am mm, co-directing together with uh, uh, Sheila Foster, who is Professor of Land Use and um, Property Law at Fordham University. I'm based in Italy, but I'm traveling quite extensively lately, and I'm trying to, to, to understand whether we could uh, apply the same design principles and the same methodology 
in other, in other urban areas. I spent the last summer in, in New York City with Sheila trying to establish the Co-City project in, in, uh, in, in New York and it seems that uh, it's gaining momentum as the City Council of, of New York is, is evaluating uh, seriously, quite seriously, uh, the possibility to apply the Co-City project also in New York City. And I'm working in Amsterdam with ECF, the European Cultural Foundation, to, to do the same in, in Amsterdam. So, basically, it all started uh, from uh, my studies on our studies on, on, on the commons, around the commons. And uh, I have received very strict guidelines uh, from Jerry to keep it uh, short and simple. So, it's almost a, a mission impossible, but I'll try to, to do you know, the best I can. To, ex uh, to explain, first of all, what the commons are, then uh, what was the, the, what is considered uh, the best achievement uh, in this area, uh, uh, which is this regulation on the urban commons that I drafted for the city of Bologna and it's now spreading in many cities in Italy and all over also uh, Europe, uh, as uh, you know, is, is, con is basically taken into consideration uh, by many other cities, and then I'll try to 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 little bit to to explain a little bit about what is uh, beyond the, the, this regulation, what has what has happened beyond this regulation, after the regulation, what we learned from the regulation. This is the idea of the city as a commons. So, so to go from urban commons to the city as a commons. So, commons are basically a shared resource. Uh, and a shared resource by a community, by a local community, and this sharing happens to be, uh, and has to be shared, this resource through cooperative management schemes. And so this is, these are the three main elements for, for the notion of commons according to Elinor Ostrom, who won also the Nobel Prize for Economy, Economy in 2009. So the idea that you have a shared resource, that you have a community that is willing to take care of that shared resource, and through a cooperative governance regime, which means that is the idea that the resource is put out for use by the community without, uh, without uh, necessarily exclude anyone. So without uh, basically injecting in the governance an exclusion mechanism like price. Price is an exclusion mechanism through which you, you can exclude people from, from using the same resource. So, it's, it, it has been considered as a third way beyond the state and the market. We consider this as uh, also a way to, to prepare new forms of state and market sometimes based on the idea that you can have open access to the resource. And this, this idea of open access is an idea that we got from the studies of another uh, scholar, a legal scholar, Car Carol Rose, that you see here in the picture. That's Elinor Ostrom, this is uh, Carol Rose. And Carol Rose understood one thing, that there are not just the, co the Ostrom commons, the commons that Elinor Ostrom studied, which were basically natural resource commons. Resources that are basically sh congestible, and because of overconsumption, this overconsumption uh, could lead, because of the fact that they are non-excludable, they can, they can trigger overconsumption, and overconsumption can trigger tragedy of the commons. So Carol Rose showed that there are other kind of commons, the non-congestible commons, the, the, one con the open commons, those commons for which, instead of having the tragedy of the commons, you can have the comedy of the commons. So it's not, it's not uh, the problem is not basically finding way to share, it's more about getting more people to collaborate and cooperate to generate new commons. She would say the more, the merrier. Instead, this is, and so what we framed was the idea that you can have two different commons, so the congestible commons, you can think of the natural resource commons and the non-congestible commons, the open commons, you can think of culture, you can think of knowledge commons. 
the one commons for which you need to actually trigger congestion, you need to, to trigger agglomeration, you need to convene people, you need to, uh, you need to engage people in order to co-produce the commons. Stop me whenever you, you think something is, is, is unclear, because I think that many things are still unclear. So, basically, what we got is that we need to have two different... We need to make sure that everybody understands that there are two different, let's say, social technology around the commons. One is sharing and the other one is collaboration. Both of them need cooperation. Because you need cooperation both in sharing, in order to share the resource, a, a renewable resource, a congestible resource that if it's not shared through a cooperative regime can be distracted, can be destroyed by overconsumption. And as well, when you have a non-congestible resource, you need cooperation in, uh, in the form of collaboration to co-produce to co-produce that, that, that resource, to co think about this place. This place is a university. The university was designed as a commons. The first university was, at least in Europe, in Europe was founded in Bologna in, in 1088 as a commons. Uh, it was founded by students that needed, that came together and they needed to, f to basically fund their studies and they chose their, their, their scholars. So the, the, the knowledge was a commons and the university was run by the students, not by professors. So, exactly, so to make it a long story short, a commons is a, a commonly managed resource that you can either share or co cooperate or collaborate for. So, where do we get into the picture, Sheila and I? All these streams of thought, they, they, they talked about the commons both in a natural context or in a very immaterial context, knowledge. Noon tried to convene these two streams of thought in the city. And none of those streams of thought tried to also reason and create a common logic between sharing and collaboration. And that's where Sheila and I came in. I, I was, of course, 10 years ago, a very young, very, I mean, very young. I was a young scholar, a young, a young student, actually, I would say. And I was, I was, I, I was writing my studies around uh, matters that have to do with, uh, with local government, as, uh, as Jerry was describing. And, of course, I encountered also the studies of, of Sheila Foster around, around uh, ecological space, the city as an ecological space, and all the environmental studies that she was carrying out within the, within the city, within the city framework. But I was also trying to uh, redesign the city government with the lenses of the commons. And as, as, as Jerry was mentioning, I wrote many, I read several books on, on uh, publicly owned companies on urban mobility and, and these things that I studied, I always studied through the lenses of the commons, through the lenses so of management and governance regimes that would put the community, the commons, in the driver's seat. But I never, I never thought that this would be something that would be done in play, in, let, let's say, in substitution of either the government or, or, or the private sector. I always thought that this would be a form of cooperation, of collaboration between these three main actors, the, uh, as I said, the public, the private, and, and the commons, the community. So I injected this basic insight into this uh, regulatory piece that I was called to draft uh, for the city of Bologna. And it all started because of these benches that you see in the picture. You see in the picture Sheila and I, and some of my students, and then in the middle, Neil Gorenflo is uh, uh, editor-in-chief of Shareable. Uh, it's, it's a blog about sharing economy, a certain kind of sharing economy. 
based in the Silicon Valley. So it all started because of these two benches, because at some point in, in Bologna, it was 2008 when I came back from the States to, to Italy and I started this uh, applied research project in Italy, uh, two ladies, two old ladies wanted to basically sit on a bench in their park. They said, we want to have, we want to, we want to enjoy this park and this park does, does not have any benches. And, you know, they, they knocked on the door of, of the city government, of city hall, and they said, look, I, we understand that you are going through a crisis. It, it's 2008, 2009, and uh, maybe you, you are distracted by other problems, main, main, main problems. We want to do something for the city. And this, of course, was a, a sort of distortion in the system, because city governments and city administrations, especially in Italy and especially in continental Europe, are not used to have... Uh, citizens acting uh, on behalf of themselves, citizens acting not just to claim or to just uh, ask something from the government, but to give solutions. It was impossible for the city to allow them at that time to legitimately, you know, hmm? legitimately. legitimately give something for the community. Because the whole bureaucratic system, the whole regulatory system was designed on the premise of a city government that is, is either a leviathan, a command and control state, uh, public actor, or a gargantua state, a provider, a welfare state, some, a, a, a government that is providing services. It's not conceived as a state, as a form of a public body that is able to work with the citizens and not on behalf of the citizens. So, of course, they asked me to, to draft this, uh, this regulation and, and uh, I, gave a, I gave them some insights and they drafted their, a first version of the regulation which was, because I was still in Rome, you know, uh, working in Rome, and they said, look, we tried to in inject these principles in, the, in a regulation and it didn't work. And the reason why it didn't work was because it was drafted in a very bureaucratic way. As any other regulatory piece in, in the city was drafted in any other cities because it was drafted without the citizens. So when they came back to me and they said, look, you gave us your expertise as a professor, but it didn't work. And I told them, yes, it, of course it didn't work because you didn't inject the methodology. You didn't design this regulatory piece together with those who are supposed to implement it we, together with those who are supposed to own the regulatory piece that you want to uh, in, implement. And with the regulatory piece that is, is supposed to basically end over and basically make the city co-owned and co-managed by the citizens. So, and this is a basic insight that I got from, from Eleanor Ostrom design principles. She would say the second design principle you always need to design the governance by tailoring the governance on, the on, on, on make it appropriate to local conditions. So what I, what I said, we need, to, we need to go on the ground and start an experiment, start the experimentation grounds in the, in the city and try to understand, first of all, what are the urban commons in, in Bologna, because they might be different from, from the urban commons in Rome, and then we need to understand what they are capable of and they are willing of managing as urban commons because it's not always the same as in, in, in Liverpool or in Bologna. So you need to really work with citizens and city inhabitants to understand what are, first of all, the common resources they want to share and the rules that they want to, they think they are, they, they want to draft, they want to design for themselves. So, I don't want to, mm, you know, mm, lose too much time on this, but basically the, the, the regulation was designed to, to uh, after these three, ex three experimentation grounds, three experimentations in, in, in the city, was designed to end over the management of uh, public space, green spaces in the city, abandoned buildings. So, 
all this idle capacity that was in the city and that was capacity that could be put at use of and managed by, by the city inhabitants to run all sorts of initiatives from cultural initiative to economic initiatives uh, uh, social and solidarity, social enterprises, uh, uh, cultural startups, and uh, even uh, art artistic uh, uh, performances in the public space, or or co-manage the parks as as we saw before. So, and the idea, what what we realized while we were doing this, it was that we were not just designing new forms of co-management of these single assets. We were basically writing an urban constitution. We were basically <laughs> going through an urban constitutionality process, as some scholars have called it. We were basically redrafting or writing the social contract at the urban level between the city inhabitants, the community, which is which at some point we realized was not just the, the, the youngsters or the old ladies that wanted to take, but it was also at some point the businesses that they understood that maybe they, through this process and through this regulation they could start managing some parts of, of, of the city, some parts of some angles, some neighborhoods, some blocks, whatever, you know, some clusters of the city. So we were basically rewriting the constitution of the, or at, the, at, the, at, the, at the urban level and, and we were also starting a transfer, transformation process of the governance of the city, which is uh, still at the very beginning, because as I will say in a little while, we are still at the very beginning of this transformation transition process and we were also transforming the way city government and city administration is designed and is supposed to work for the citizens and, for the, and with the citizens. So that's basically uh, you know, the kind of, uh, of, uh, of lessons that we learned. I will, I will go back to this uh, by explaining what you know, we now encompass with this or understand we with this formula, the city as a commons. So from the urban commons to the city as a commons. The city as a commons is basically about four, four design principles. The first one is about redesigning the governance of the city by embracing the idea of the co-governance, the urban co-governance. The second is about redesigning the state not as a command and control entity or as a, as a, a gargantua state, but as an enabling state. A state that enables, as I will say in a little while, the civic imagination of the city inhabitants. The third is about pooling economy. It's about a, a, a form of uh, sharing or social and solidarity economy that works on creating urban pools, social and economic pools within the city, to fight for social justice, diversities, and, you know, and, and, and abolish divides in the city, and address divides and, and, and take care of, of, of social and economic divides in the city. And, that, and the fourth thing is about, basically, the way you do it. It's about this experimentalist approach that you always need to have to, uh, to experiment the redesign of public policies in the city together with, you know, with, with, the, with the common methodological protocol that we call the co-city protocol and that envisages the collaboration between the city government, the city activists and, and, and the university, the knowledge institutions. So let's start with the first point and the first design principle. So what is urban co-governance? Think about the city think about how it is being governed so far. It was first governed as through a public governance approach. It was all about the city governments deliver, and, you know, deliver, the, delivering all the services or exercising command and control. And at some point, 
we understood that it was not enough, that the public alone could not do it by itself, that it needed the, the help of the private sector. And that's where it started the public-private governance of the city. And we know now that public-private partnerships and public-private governance of the city is not functioning always properly. And it's, it's not creating the kind of social progress and also social justice and equality that it, it was supposed to bring. So what we started to say is that we need co-governance, which means that we need a third actor in the, in the, in the picture. We need to create public-private community partnerships public-private commons partnerships. What we understand as commons is, is basically civil society, and I think that knowledge institutions, you know, civil society is composed by knowledge institutions, civil society organizations, and what Carol Rose called the unorganized public, the civic innovators, the social innovators, the mm, digital, you know, the, the, the digi digital programmers that are in the city, the, the urban farmers, the city makers, they call them in, in Amsterdam. They have many names, but they are the informal actor, the one actor, the, the civil society actor that is not structured, is not organized uh, in, in, as a civil society organization, is, is very, is, is the kind of the newcomer to the, to, the, to the picture. So you have these basically five actors, three of them are the commons, and this is the quintuple helix governance scheme. So Silicon Valley and Stanford University at some point to, to understand and to explain how innovation could be driven at the local level coined this idea of the triple helix. So it's not, the it's not just public, it's not public-private, it's public-private knowledge institutions. Because knowledge institutions are supposed to bring knowledge to the private, to the industry sector, to produce patents, to produce innovation, together with city and local governments. So what we understood by working on the ground is that we need a different approach. From the idea of the public-private commons partnership, we coined this idea of the quintuple helix governance of, this, of, of the city, in which these five actors work together. So again, public-private, knowledge institutions, civil society organizations, and, and social innovators, city makers, citizens, active citizens, those who are acting and that are not sometimes, not, they are not even willing to subscribe to a, a civil society organization. They are informal groups sometimes. They can activate themselves only for one day or maybe a week, but they don't want to be involved every, every, you know, as, as a social actor, as a social institution. But they are willing to take action on an informal way, on an informal, you know, foot sometimes. So the idea of the quintuple helix was embedded in the, in the, in the governance of the, of, of, of the, of the um, so we now have basically 245 packs of collaboration and we, in, in, uh, in, in, in Bologna and many other cities that are, are working on, uh, on, on this. But what we understood is that to have these five actors working together, <coughs> you need to have uh, a sort of pivotal actor, five minutes, Okay, so I have really, I have to go, I have to rush. So basically, the second, the second design principle of the city as a commons is transforming the city government into an enabler. And to do that, you need to have new forms and new approaches within the city, within the city government. So we designed this office for civic imagination because we need to understand that bureaucrats and civil servants and even policymakers and politicians need to be now a sort of uh, pivotal actors hmm? pivotal sorry for the pronunciation pivotal actors that leverage the civic imagination so the capabilities the imagination the ideas the energies that are in the community and they need to also change the way and the capabilities and the, actually the expertise that they use. 
because in order to make people collaborate and cooperate, you need to give up on command and control. You need to give up on the idea that you are the owner of the resources and you distribute them. You need to make people align their interests and maybe use service design, which is a new kind of facilitation process. This is just to say some of, of the examples. That, but, but this is basically the, a new institution that is composed by civil servants, policy makers, civil, civil, civil leaders like, uh, like Jerry, Jerry, Jerry and, and also normal, and normal citizens that work together on specific projects together to redesign public policies. This is about, you know, pooling economy, but I want to go basically what the Office for Civic Imagination is using is, is also a new approach, a new methodology, and that's the Cosidi Protocol. It's, this is basically what we learned by, by designing the regulation first and other public policies then, especially one on public housing, by working with communities and with knowledge institutions, the five actors that I explained earlier. So these five, six steps basically that we use to, to redesign public policies, to make it commons based and to, 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 to make them also a way to leverage the no local knowledge. We start by using what Eleanor Rostrom called the chip talking. Basically, this is a chip talk. We are starting to chip talk about, about the commons and we are starting to create what? Basically trust, mutual trust, a relationship. The two minutes that Jerry asked you to, to spend knowing each other, it was to create a way, it was a way to create a relationship between you, uh, you know, with your peers, you know, the person sitting next to you. And this is important because for collaboration you need this kind of trust and, and mutual relation, mutuality. So once you start chip talking and you start a series of chip talks in the city, you start mapping and calling on other people, or other citizens, other civil society organizations that either might be using the same language, they might be doing the same kind of projects, but they are not using the same language, but they are basically applying the same values and the same principles. Sometimes we are not inventing anything, sometimes we, are not, we, we just need to give we you just need to raise awareness of this transition process that is happening and to convene and, and coalesce more and more uh, people in the city. And then what is very important is before you start designing the moon, you start practicing together. You do stuff together because that's important for two reasons. First, to nurture and cultivate the kind of trust that we, I was talking about before, and also to understand what is needed for that city. Because what is needed in, in, in Bologna, or in Rome, or in, in Paris, is, might not be needed in, 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 in Amsterdam or Liverpool. So you really need to practice together to understand what, is, what the city needs, what the, the city can give also as an answer, and what's the way, what's appropriate to the local conditions and what is the way to the commons, to the city as a commons for the specific city. Once you, you, you practice together, then you prototype. You prototype because the idea is that you, you don't produce a, a finite product. It's a prototype. You need, we are experimenting the commons in the city and the city as a commons. So you need to come up with the idea, you need to accept the idea that it's not like in the old days when you have a law and the law is supposed to be forever. Or you have a regulation and the regulation is supposed to be forever. No, it's like in the, in the, in the digital world where you have iterations, you have softwares that uh, you, you have different releases and through different releases you improve them. And you need to accept the idea of failure, of mistakes, of errors, of error and trial also in public policy. And this is kind of how you, you then get to the modeling. For us, the regulation after two years of implementation is still not a model. We are now running an evaluation process which is basically the last. In fact, in some infographs, I always put the testing before the modeling because we are still trying to understand what's the right, 
uh, you know, uh, path that we need to, to follow. But the idea is that you evaluate the prototype and then maybe you model it. If you prove that that prototype was really w proved to, to address those kind of issues and those kind of principles and values that uh, we, we basically, uh, um, I basically outlined at the beginning. So on this note, I think that basically what I say is that what I want to basically leave is, is all the pictures of this is the first, the chip talks, this is the mapping exercise, this is the experimenting process and phase with the, with the city inhabitants in, in the ground, experimentation grounds in Bologna. And these are all the cities that are trying to apply the same methodology, the same values and principles that are embedded in the regulation. And now we are trying to do it and we are working with the University of Amsterdam and City of Amsterdam in Amsterdam and the City of New York and Fordham University in New York. And I would be really happy if, uh, you know, at some point we would have co-Liverpool because after all, Liverpool is, you know, the etymology of Liverpool comes from a pool. <laughs> the idea of a common pool, the water was liver, the, so it's, it's a, a water pool a pool of life. So I think that uh, it's the best city where to experiment in the UK. Thank you.